This is the meditation that I use. You say whatever it is that you would like to attract into your life. A great job, a great relationship, a body that is in perfect health, whatever it might be. Write it down. Put it in words. Whatever you would like to manifest, whatever it might be, write it out and keep it next to where you meditate. And then use this mantra for 20 minutes. And the mantra is... Wayne Dyer was an icon in self-development and spiritual growth. He wrote over 40 books with an astonishing 21 New York Times bestsellers. His childhood was spent in orphanages and foster homes, but he'd go on to inspire millions and become known as the father of motivation. In his exclusive speech from the Celebrate Your Life stage, Wayne Dyer shares with us the keys to manifest things into existence, elevate your life to the next level, and make the mindset shift for success. Special thanks to Liz Dawn for partnering with us to release this exclusive content on our YouTube channel. Enjoy. So I want to talk uh, in the last hour and a half or so that we have tonight on uh, a way of manifesting and attracting things into your life that is virtually fail-safe based upon the teachings of uh, U.S. Anderson and uh, Neville Goddard. You may not have heard of them before, but uh, you will be soon. And I also want to speak about my own journey and some of the things that have been going on with me. And I'd like to start with the idea that any of you that are here would come to a, a conference called Celebrate Your Life and invest your time and your, and your money and your energy into uh, a weekend such as this with so many great, powerful teachers that are here. I'm uh, proud to be among them and humbled by it. But I don't think that you would be here if there wasn't a part of you, someplace inside of you, that wanted to elevate your life in some way, to get to a higher place, whatever it might be. That there might be some sense of inner uh, recognition, perhaps, that where you are is fine, but where you would like to go and where you would like to be and what your dharma might be, what your purpose on this planet is, it may elude you just a little bit, or you may feel that there's more, there's something else that I'm here for. So that in order to change and elevate your life, if we use this as ordinary levels of consciousness, this place here that I'll be using my hand to just demonstrate when I speak about just being at an ordinary level of consciousness, being able to fulfill your life and, uh, and things are all right. But there's a, another level of consciousness, uh, super consciousness. In India, they call it um, Siddhi consciousness. In the Middle East, they call it Christ consciousness or God consciousness or God realization. It's a place where you begin to recognize your own divinity. And from that place, as it says in the New Testament, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. And being able to go from here to here means that you have to change your concept of yourself. And this is not something that comes easy. In fact, in this room, there's probably 2,000 people or so here tonight. There are only a handful that will actually do it. A lot of people will pay lip service to it. And I'm one. I mean, I've paid lip service to it a lot in my life. And now, finally, in my seventh decade, I'm beginning to understand it. Neville said that uh, in order to understand or learn something mentally, you have to think about it. You have to cogitate on it. You have... Uh, you, you contemplate it. That's the process of learning something mentally. In order to learn something spiritually, you must experience it. It's not enough to just think about it and analyze it. In fact, analyzing it usually keeps you from doing it. It's that uh, sense of being able to live it and to know it. So your concept of yourself that you brought into this room tonight is everything that you believe to be true about yourself and about this life that you live. Everything that you believe to be true. So just think on this for a second. Everything that you believe to be true about yourself got you to here, to ordinary level of consciousness, or a place where you would like to get a little higher. So in order to get here, you have to change some things that you've come to believe are true, like who you are and what your capacities are and what is possible for you and uh, what you can and can't accomplish, what the world is. It's like making those shifts. And these shifts are um, things that have been planted in you from the time that you were little boys and little girls. We call them prompters or um, we call them memes, M-E-M-E. -M -E interesting word. It's like, a, it's like a virus that's placed in you when you're a little boy or a little girl. And like most viruses that, uh, you know, like if you think of a virus in a computer or a virus in your body medically, a virus is, um, has three functions. Its first function is to duplicate itself. That's what a virus does. It just likes itself so much it just makes another one just keeps duplicating itself and duplicating itself. And it also, purpose, second purpose is to infiltrate. 
so that any place that there's an opening, as it duplicates, it also enters there. And the third purpose of a virus is to spread from one host to the next host to the next host to the next host. Duplicate, infiltrate, spread. And if you know anything about computer viruses, you know that's exactly what happens. They duplicate, duplicate, fast, 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 fast. Any place that there's an opening in the computer, it goes. And then if there's another computer that it can get into, off it goes. And we've got a virus. Same thing happens with a virus in your body. So those are things that we can look through a microscope and look at and say, okay, that's a virus. But there are other viruses that uh, we call mind viruses. And a mind virus is, uh, has the exact same purpose. Its purpose is to duplicate, infiltrate, and spread. And they really do spread, these ideas, particularly about our limitations and who we are. So making that shift is what I want to talk about somewhat here tonight. Changing our concept of ourself and changing what is true, what we believe is true. I came across something that I haven't told in a long time, and I thought I'd read it to you tonight. It was uh, They had a conference, I think it was in Salt Lake City, and there was a woman there, her name was Portia Nelson. And they were all told to write their biography of their... Uh, life, but they had to do it on a three by five cards and they could only do five. So they had to tell their whole life story in five three by five cards, five chapters. And this is what Portia wrote. Chapter one of my life. I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I am lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place. But it isn't my fault. It still takes a long time to get out. Chapter three. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. And I get out immediately. Chapter four of my life. I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five. I walk down another street. <laughs> Not good? Now, I want to tell you a story. I was so blessed in uh, 1978. I was 38 years old. I had two huge best-selling books that were uh, international hits. One was called Your Erroneous Owns, which a lot of you took home in brown paper bags. I walked into an airport in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, when I was on a book tour, and they had all of the books over here, and then they had the sort of the pornography section over here, and they had a whole bunch of books like Do Me, Do Me, Do Me, and The Pizza Man Always Delivers, or something, I don't know, what it was, uh, and there was my face, smiling away, your erroneous sounds, you know. Right in the middle. So whoever was putting the books in there, I thought then. I remember another time in, uh, I was speaking in Houston, Texas, and the speaker, uh, the guy who was introducing me, was introduced me this way by telling the story of, uh, he said, uh, last night, he said, uh, I was at home and uh, my wife was upstairs and uh, I glanced at what she was reading. And uh, I looked in there and I thought, hmm, this is going to be a good night. And uh, he said, I went into the bathroom and I got my banaka and I, I put the deodorant on and took a shower. And uh, I got into bed next to her and uh, she started talking to me about my attitude. He said, it wasn't what I had in mind at all. <laughs> at any rate, that book was followed by a book called uh, Pulling Your Own Strings. And because these books were... Uh, so well received, I was invited to go to Vienna, Austria, for a group, an organization called YPO, Young Presidents Organization. And it's an organization of presidents of companies. You have to be under the age of 50, and you have to have more than, I think, I don't know, 200 employees or something like that. I don't remember all the details, but... Uh, and they put on these universities. They don't pay you for speaking. They just invite you to these fabulous things. And I remember at this one in 1978, Walter Mondale was one of the speakers. He was on, I was on with him. And, um, you know, they bring and lots of uh, high-profile people from all over the world. And it's really just, and they take you and they just treat you unbelievably. They actually rented a whole town in Austria for the night. And they took... Uh, at any rate, I was put on a panel with uh, two other people. One of them, her name was uh, Virginia Satir. She was a uh, family therapist, very, very famous family therapist. And the other person I was put on the panel with was, uh, it just shocked me. I was uh, in such awe that I didn't even felt like I belonged in the same city with this man, let alone uh, being on a panel and having discussions and talking to these presidents of corporations from all over the world. His name was Viktor Frankl. Now, when I was a doctoral student, eight years before that, we used Man's Search for Meaning as a textbook to try to teach people something called logotherapy, to help people to find meaning in their life. And this was a man who was a psychiatrist in Germany, in Berlin, and he was lifted out of there and put into Auschwitz in Poland as a uh, concentration camp 
victim for the next six years. And he survived because he had to tell the story, and he knew he had to tell the story, and he was keeping notes and, and smuggling things out. And, uh, and I remember that at that, I just sat there in awe with my mouth open that I could even be, like I say, on the same panel with this man that had been through so much and was such a hero to me. And not only that, but I, I studied his work. It was like last week, again, like last week when I was speaking there, there was Ramdas sitting over there in his wheelchair taking notes on what I was saying. <laughs> There's still just a little orphan boy in here that can't quite even comprehend that you're all here because I have eight kids and they don't listen to anything I say. <laughs> you know? So there's a lot of humility in, in me, I promise you. And um, Victor Frankl said you had to, and he said something to me after that I've never forgotten. He said, when you find yourself in life in situations in which you can't do anything about the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. And he said, that's what I had to do. And he told the story of them bringing a bowl of dirty water with a floating fish head, a dead fish head in dirty water. And that was to be his meal for the day. And he... Just thinking about it, I, he was able to find meaning and beauty in this floating fish head. And he said the people who he worked with as a psychiatrist, working with the, uh, and he was, of course, getting losing weight and getting smaller and smaller and wasting away himself. And he told how people would believe that they were going to be liberated on a certain day, like April the 30th, 1944. And they had set that in their mind that they would be liberated that day. And that day would come and they wouldn't be liberated. And the next day they would be dead. And he said on the death certificate it always said they died of tuberculosis or whatever it was. But he said they died because they lost meaning. They lost their sense of what I'm here for. And this talk has been called From Ambition to Meaning. It was the title of my film, The Shift, originally, Ambition to Meaning. I changed it to The Shift because I think we can shift the whole consciousness of this planet. And I believe that just this number of people, if we could get that shift underway, we could reverberate that out and make a huge, huge difference in this world. So um, when I left Vienna, I communicated with Dr. Frankel for a while, and I've never forgotten this whole notion of being able to uh, help someone to find this thing called meaning. And as a young doctoral student in my 20s, I was also blessed to be a student of Abraham Maslow. Dr. Maslow passed away on the 17th of June in 1970, the same day that I walked across the stage at Cobo Hall in Detroit and was handed my doctoral degree. And it was almost as if he handed me a baton. And he said that I've explained this concept of elevated consciousness. He called it self-actualization. I've explained it to the academic world. If you've read Toward a Psychology of Being or... And, and most of you know about the pyramid of Maslow and studied him and so on well. He said, when you get this, and he knew that we were in training to become therapists, uh, that if you ever really want to uh, reach a person that you want to help, if you're in the helping professions or if you're a parent or if you're a priest or if you're a teacher or a counselor or a psychologist, or psychiatrist, whatever it might be, if you really want to reach another human being, he said, when you sit down to talk to them, don't talk to them about their problems. Don't spend more than a minute or two on their problems because you become what you think about, whether you want it or not. And he used to say that therapy is for better or for worse, that if you're operating at a lower level of self-actualization than the person you're attempting to help or to heal, then you will not only not help that person, you will keep them from being able to grow. You will be doing them a disservice by just being in their presence. And speaking to them about their problems, and we used to say, well, what, what do you mean? And he would say, get them to focus on what they want to become, that self-actualizing people never place their attention on what they don't want or what they can't do. They're not even wired together that way. They're wired together in a very different way, a way that's very difficult to explain. But um, And I didn't know that I was going to be talking about this right now because I just know that I don't deliver the speeches, that God writes all the books and delivers all the speeches and builds all the bridges and this is what I'm supposed to talk about for a little while tonight. Paramahansa Yogananda used to open his talks by saying this, shh, shh, listen, can you hear the music? He would say, can you hear the music? It's playing, it's playing, why can't you hear it? Oh, give someone over there a radio and turn it to 96.5 <laughs> and the music plays. 
And give someone over here one, and it's 91.3, and you'll hear the music playing. There's music playing all over the place, but we can't hear it. Now take that radio and open it up and see if you can find the music in there. There's no music in that radio. He said, that's how God is. You just can't hear it because you're not aligned. And the minute that you align, you'll hear it all. And boy, I'll tell you, I've never forgotten that. I wasn't blessed to ever be with Paramahansa Yogananda, but I read everything about him and all of his teachings. Passed away when I was a young man. When I was in my doctoral program, we had a professor there. His name was Fritz Radl, R-E-D-L. He was probably the most popular professor on the campus. And this is at Wayne State University. I had my kids all convinced for years that they named that thing after me. I did. They used to even tell their friends, no, really, really, honest, no, really, I'm not kidding you, man, I'm telling you, my dad had a university named after him. It used to be the Detroit City College, and they named it, I'd have this great story going with them. <laughs> anyway, it was a very large university in the center of Detroit, 45,000 students, it was a, a medical school there and so on, but Fritz Radl was, uh, and he, he and, uh, he's the one who brought uh, Maslow to, to the university, and how I got to be involved in Maslowian uh, teaching. And um, he had a seminar that uh, only doctoral students could get into, but even getting into it, he had a, a class that he taught on Tuesday evenings every, every Tuesday from like 7 to 9 o'clock. And there were more people in the class than there are in this room. And just getting in, I mean, everybody wanted to sign up for it. And he would come in and he would tell, he knew Viktor Frankl. He was from Austria himself. And he was funny and fun. And you automatically got a minimum of a B just by being in his class. Another reason 2,000 people were always in the class. <laughs> But more than that, just being in his presence, he was just such a beautiful, great teacher. And I always wanted to get to know him more because I took the, the one class. And when I got into the doctoral program, there were only six of us. And they would do it by lottery because there would be like 40 doctoral students and there were only room for six. And I got in. I really think that my uh, advisor, Dr. Mildred Peters, I think she pulled some strings and got me in. I can feel Mildred Peters right here, right now. She has to be dead because she was about 70. And that was 1966 or 67 so anyway I feel her I just see her she's a great guide for me I'll tell you more about her later so we're in the uh, seminar and it's every Thursday and it's three hours and it goes seven o'clock to ten o'clock and we each do cases we have patients that we're working with clients that we're working with and we're doing case studies and we would go in and we would read them and then um, he would discuss them and talk about, and we would do tapes, and he would analyze the tapes, and it was just, it was just so, no, nobody ever missed his class. And he gave us our grades on the first day. Everybody got an A. This is a little doctoral program toward the very end of it. So there was no issue about doing this because we were uh, going to have some external reward that was all handled for us. And um, he came in one evening, and he laid this out. He said, we talked about self-actualization a lot, and I'll be talking about it tonight, obviously. <laughs> And he said that um, a self-actualized man arrives at a dinner party, and there are several hundred people there, and they're all dressed in black tie or semi-formal attire or suits and ties and, and dresses and so on. And a self-actualized man arrives at the dinner party, and he's wearing a pair of jeans and a T-shirt, baseball hat, and sneakers. What does he do? And he walks out of the room. He said, you have 15 minutes. This is your exam, midterm. I was 28 years old. I just was so full of myself and so certain that uh, I would pass this one easily. And uh, I wrote furiously about how he wouldn't leave and he wouldn't pay attention to it and he wouldn't apologize for it. And he would feel confident within himself and he wouldn't be uh, letting anybody judge him on the basis of what he wore and... Uh, and so on. And Fritz came back into the room and he had each of us read our answer. And each one of us read it out loud, 15 minutes of writing, a couple of pages. And he slammed his folder. He had this manila folder with all these papers in it all the time. And he slammed it down on the desk. He says, you don't know a goddamn thing, any of you. He walked out of the room like he was angry at us. Then he came back a couple minutes later and he said, none of you got it right. He said, you only needed three words. He wouldn't notice. He wouldn't notice. This is how these people are wired together, in such a way that appearances and how a person is dressed or what they look like passes by because Maslow said there are four characteristics or qualities of self-actualizing people. Well, there's actually 37. And if you read a book I wrote many years ago called The Sky's the Limit, it's all about that. And a book that I wrote about how to raise children to become self-actualized children called What Do You Really Want for Your Children? It's based on what I learned about self-actualization. They're 25 years old or or more.
But the top four qualities of self-actualization were, the first was to become independent of the good opinion of other people, that this is what self-actualizers do. They don't run their life on the basis of um, what anybody else might think or say. They are independent of uh, any consideration about what other people might do, and they cause a lot of problems because of that. And they can't be dissuaded from their vision of who they are and what they're for. They are fulfilling their own dharma. They're not trying to fulfill someone else's idea of what their dharma should be or not be. And dharma is just a word for, it's in the movie, but it's just, it's a, it's just, it's a Sanskrit word for purpose, if you will. You know, this is what you're here for. Meaning. When you're aligned with meaning. In the shift at the end, I quoted uh, my friend Joel Gold's, my friend, <laughs> I never met him, but uh, <laughs> he lived on Maui, and I've always thought of him as my friend. And the reason that I think of him as my friend is because Alexandra, who's now 94, I believe, dated him on Maui, and I've, and I've been over at her home so many times, and, uh, oh, i got to put glasses on for this. <laughs> he wrote uh, many, many books, Joel Goldsmith. A parentheses in eternity is what I'm quoting from here that your life is just a parenthesis in eternity. He said, then there are those who reach a stage in which they realize the futility of this constant striving and struggling for the things that perish, things which after they are obtained prove to be shadows. It is at this stage that some persons turn from this seeking for things in the outer realm to a seeking for them from God. And I wrote that in there at the end of this companion book to the movie. This business of being independent of the good opinion of other people is something that um, I guess I was blessed because that's pretty much the way I've always run my life. I wrote this book for um, my teenage children because I kept a diary for years of the uh, 10 most important uh, ideas or thoughts that I had carried around. And the, one of the first ones I did when I was 19, and I've told the story before, I'm not going to tell it again, but it was uh, basically don't die with your music still in you. Don't get to the end of your life. And uh, I used to say this to myself when I would, uh, when I'd be playing tennis, I used to play tennis tournaments, and I'd find myself being cautious and careful and hanging back, you know, just especially when I'd get ahead and get close to the end of it and just want to just put this person away and getting that tentative and you can feel it and you see it in competitive athletics a lot and I used to say to myself what I had written in there about don't die with your music still in you that uh, don't die wondering I should remind myself of that I had that sometimes I would take that out into the tournament and I'd have it in my pocket and when I would change sides I'd reach in there and say now damn it <laughs> don't die wondering you know whether you could win this match or not don't die by playing tentative. Hit the damn ball. And if it goes out, it goes out. You'll at least know. Don't, and I say that to you, all of you, not just in tennis matches, but about everything in your life. You came here from a place uh, in ambition, in uh, the shift from ambition to meaning. There's four chapters from ambition to and meaning. And I'll talk a little bit about them tonight. But from is like, where did we come from? And uh, that's been a really big theme for me lately. T.S. Eliot said that we shall not cease from exploration, but at the end of all of our exploring will be to return to the place from which we originated, but to know it for the first time, to know it. And he was talking about death, but I'm not. I think we can know it where we came from if we align ourselves with our dharma, with our purpose, with God, and begin to live from a, a God-realized place. Uh, I was down in Australia just recently, and they asked me on the equivalent of The Tonight Show down there, what is your mission? What is your mission? What are you here for? And I immediately responded, I would like to live a God-realized life. I would like to understand what Einstein meant when he said, I don't care about the details of quantum physics. He said, all I want to do is learn to think like God thinks. How does God think? And who is God? But I'll have the answer for that for you before you leave tonight. That's a pretty good promise, isn't it? <laughs> it is. You'll be surprised. So we have this purpose, this mission, and... Um, being independent of the good opinion of other people is like just all out crucial. I mean, I can't even imagine. That's why Maslow labeled it always first. Because so many of us are attempting to live a dharma that has been laid out for us by other people. And therefore, we always lack passion. And without passion, you know, the, the word for enthusiasm breaks down in Greek to the God within. If you don't have enthusiasm, enthusiasm, if you don't have that, you are doing what somebody else has laid out for you or what you've been told is the right thing to do or why you're supposed to do it. And if you don't listen to that calling of yours, that thing inside of you that says, the 
this is what you're here for, and you have to fulfill it. And you can't pay attention to whether anybody else agrees with it or likes it or dislikes it or thinks it's right or wrong or proper or improper. You have to be a scurvy elephant. I've told this story so many times, it's become identified with me. People send me little elephants that are really scurvy looking from all over the world. But when I was, I lived in an orphanage until I was 10. And then my mom got us all back together again because my father just walked out on us when I was born, right after I was born. I was the youngest of three. And I came home from school the first day, the Wednesday after Labor Day was when we started school. And I heard Mrs. Poole telling the principal that Wayne Dyer was in her classroom and that he was a scurvy elephant. And so I, I got home and I asked Mrs. Scarf, what's a scurvy elephant? And she said she'd never heard it. Where did you hear that? And I told her and she got on the telephone and she called the principal and Mrs. Smith and she said, oh, that's Wayne. He gets everything mixed up. She didn't say that he was a scurvy elephant in her classroom. She said that he was a disturbing element <laughs> in her classroom. And you have to be a scurvy elephant. You have to uh, be someone who's willing to, um, you know, I mean, it's just such an old line from Hamlet, to be or not to be. It's just, uh, but it's just a great question, isn't it? You know, am I going to or am I not going to be? But what follows that is even more profound. Whether it is nobler in the minds of men to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and thus, by opposing, end them. <laughs> That's your choice, whether you're going to be or not to be. Whenever I fly on an airplane, I always ask for seat to be. <laughs> always. I do. You see me on a plane and it's open, I get to be. I could go to or not to be, but I don't. I go to to be. So I urge you, I mean, if you're thinking self-actualization, you're thinking of the, that pyramid, you're thinking of that, you know, that little section of the pyramid at the end. Down here at the base of the pyramid is just fulfilling your basic needs and taking care of them and handling them and then your needs for belonging and your needs for love and your needs for family. And needs of, but up here, up here at the top, Maslow called called this self-actualization. And those people are, uh, they're like Thoreau. I mean, Thoreau wrote an essay at Walden Pond on the necessity of civil disobedience after going to jail and refusing to pay his taxes in 1843 in Concord, Massachusetts, because he said that anybody who pays their taxes to a country who is, this was our Holocaust, this was legislation that was passed in 1830 by and signed by President Andrew Jackson of Tennessee called the Indian Removal Act, which allowed anybody to remove Native American people from the lands that they had occupied for thousands of years and march them off to Oklahoma and put them into uh, concentration camps, no different than Auschwitz. And if they died on the way, they died on the way because they weren't people. And here was Thoreau living in Concord, Massachusetts, saying, I won't pay my taxes to a government who does this. And I have an obligation not to. And um, he was in jail. And his neighbor from two streets over and seven houses down was uh, a man you've probably heard of, a man whose picture is on my writing table and has been for 25 years, Ralph Waldo Emerson. And Emerson came to the jail and paid his bail. And Thoreau, rather than pay his taxes, went to uh, live at Walden Pond. And at Walden, he wrote his essay on the necessity of civil disobedience, how important it is to stand up. You know, my mother... I'm going to visit her on Sunday in Florida, and she's 94. And, you know, when my mother was born in 1916, women couldn't vote in America. Think of that. One generation removed from me. All the decisions that were made in all of the history of our country and the colonial history before were made by men. No, by white men. So that happened because 50% of the population began to say, it isn't going to be that way anymore. And we're going to, just because it's the law, we're going to disobey it. And I think that's what has to happen. That's how civil rights acts get passed. It's how uh, rights for people who are perhaps different than the rest, but have certainly the same rights. And we need people who are willing to stand up and say, even if it is the law, it doesn't apply to me. Sometimes it costs people their lives. It costs a lot of them their lives just to get women to vote. And now we're faced with this whole thing about gay rights and so on and whether people, it was like Victor Hugo said it so beautifully, there's nothing more powerful, he said, than an idea whose time has come. And when an idea's time has come, it can't be stopped. It just can't be stopped. And I, I think about that when I hear all of the people proselytizing about, uh, you know, God doesn't like these kind of people and God favors these kind of people. And I know there's not much of that in this room, but there's a lot of it out there, isn't there? So independence of the good opinion of other people. The second of these qualities, and, uh, you know, I'm getting ahead because I'm looking at the time and I want, so much to cover yet tonight. The second of these qualities is to uh, be detached from outcome. That's another big one. Detached from outcome. That is, self-actualizing people, said Maslow, do not do what they do because of what 
benefit will come to them. They do what they do because their heart tells them, this is who you are. And it doesn't make any difference whether you make money at it, whether you get approval or don't get approval, whether it uh, is something that uh, fits in with society, it doesn't make any difference. And you don't do what you're going to do because of how you're going to look or whether or not you're going to be approved or not approved. You do what you do because... This is who you are. I gave a talk last Saturday in Maui at the Maui Writers Conference, and I just said to them, writing is not something that I do. I don't write to sell books. I don't write to make money. I don't write to be on the bestseller list. I don't write for uh, good reviews. I write because writing is what I am. And if I didn't write, I think I would die. I think I'd wither away if I couldn't express it. And it's just something that I... And it's the same here. I mean, only because that damn Liz. Where is that Liz? Where did she go? No, seriously, uh, the whole month of October I spent studying in order to prepare to give a talk for 14 hours on uh, all new material, some of which I'll share tonight, that inside of me says, you know, you're 70 years old. You, you know that you have to exercise your body. You know you have to walk every day and you have to swim every day and you do yoga every day and you climb up to the 12th floor and back three or four times to get your heart rate up. You know that you have to stay, keep yourself in shape. You know that what not to eat. You know what to do for your body. You can't just let your mind deteriorate. You can't let yourself, you know, people ask me about retiring. I just, I don't get the concept. Retire from what to what? Retire from being? I'm not a human doing. I'm a human being. It's like, this is my beingness. Being up here talking and having people come for some reason, you come. And I got the mic. And it isn't just, a, it's not an ego trip. It's not an ego trip at all. It's, uh, it's staying sharp. It's keeping your mind sharp. It's staying on top of who you are and not because of anything else. And you just do that. You get to that place where, you know, I, I have a radio show every Monday on, on hayhouseradio.com, and I take calls from people all over the world every Monday. And that's one of my favorite hours of the week. But almost every question that comes in is about people who don't listen to their inner callings. I read an interview by uh, Arthur Miller with the New York Times. He was 91 years old, and they were interviewing him. Now, Arthur Miller is one of the most famous playwrights America ever produced in the 20th century, certainly. You know, you all read Death of a Salesman, you know, and Willie Loman and so on. And they asked him this question at 91. He said, are you working on another play? And I've loved his response. I memorized it. He said, I don't know, but I probably am. Now, does that resonate with you? Do you, do you get what, what he was saying there? Listen to, uh, I was a Jungian al analyst. That's what I was trained in. It, it's, it's, uh, let's see if I can find. Here's Carl Jung, one of the greatest minds ever. From the beginning, he said, I had a sense of destiny, as though my life was assigned to me by fate and had to be fulfilled. This gave me an inner security, and though I could never prove it to myself, it proved itself to me. I did not have this certainty. It had me. When Liz introduced me, she called me the father of motivation. Uh, and I'm already the father of enough, I promise you. <laughs> I don't need to be the father of anything more, but they, I got that label thrown at me 20 years ago or so. And motivation is like, it's, it's like an, a motivated person is someone who gets a hold of an idea and they won't let anything interfere with them accomplishing what it is that they set out to do. That's a motivated person. I'm not a motivated person. And I don't really believe much in motivation because that's all ego. You know, I'm going to do it and nobody's going to stop me and I have an idea of what I want to do, and it's me, 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 me doing that. I prefer to be called the father of inspiration. If motivation is you getting a hold of an idea and taking it to where it wants to go without anybody interfering, inspiration is the opposite. It's when an idea gets a hold of you, and it takes you where you were intended to go when you came into this world from the field of intention. And that's almost like radical humility is what you need for that. But this is what my friend Carlos Castaneda said. He said, in the universe, there is an unmeasurable, indescribable force which those who live of the source call intention. And that absolutely everything that exists in the entire cosmos is attached to intent by a connecting link. Sorcerers, that is, those who live of the source, are not only concerned with understanding and explaining that connecting link, but they are especially concerned with cleansing it of the numbing effects brought about by the concerns of living at ordinary levels of consciousness. In other words, we have a connection to this field of intention. This field of intention is that which everything is 
intended from. It is the source of all. And every single one of us is connected to it, except that the connection gets rusty. And we're going to cleanse that tonight a little bit, in a, in a little while. And when you get to this place where you understand that intention is not something that you do, that is an ego stance. Intention is something that you are a part of. It is a field of energy from which all things are intended to which all things return. And you can't ever be disconnected to, from it, but you can believe that you are. And in the process of believing that you are, you move away from your source. And in the process of moving away from your source, you detach yourself from who you really are. And instead, you begin to try to do it for other people, and you start doing things because of what may come to you instead of what intention offered you. Does that make sense? And you can do this, and you can cleanse yourself of this. And when you get to that place where you can cleanse yourself of the numbing effects brought about, they brought about because you've chosen to live at an ordinary level of consciousness, when in fact, Every single person in this room is a piece of God, all of you. The third quality of self-actualization, Maslow said, was that uh, these are people who have no investment in power over others. They have no investment in trying to dominate or control or manipulate or influence or do anything for anyone else. They're detached from all of that. They are focused on who they are, and who they are and what they do don't have any conflict. They are one with it. They let other people be who they are. Very different than what you see on Fox News. Very different from what you see on MSNBC. Very different from so much of the uh, attempt to influence and, and tell people what they should be or shouldn't be. I want to move on. The fourth is, uh, and this one I loved, and I used to think about this a lot as a young doctoral student. He said they see, remember the story of Fritz Radl and the guy at the party, who just doesn't notice what people are wearing. He said these are people who see the unfolding of God in everyone they encounter. That's what they see. They see themselves in others, the unfolding of God, because they believe that they are God, pieces of God as well. So these are the qualities. And, you know, my life just changed. It's like you just never know. A quantum moment can come along. In the movie, I talk about these quantum moments that... Uh, at Asilomar there. It was 1966, and I was 26 years old, and I was a, a, a school counselor at an all-girls school in, in Michigan, Mercy High School. And then I was the director of the counseling there, and then the assistant principal and principal there for a while. Education was where I came from. Elementary school, junior high school, high school, college, undergraduate, graduate. I taught at every level for years, seven years at a university. And being in education and being an educator is... Um, here I am, 26 years old, and I have all of the parents come in on a Monday night, and I'm, as the counseling director, just got my uh, master's degree, and I'm uh, giving a talk and telling what the school year is going to be like and telling all the parents, and this is a private school and, uh, and so on. The next day, I spoke to about 1,500 people, all the parents come in. The next day, a girl named Nancy Armstrong walks into my office and hands me a book. And she said, my mom heard you talk last night, and she was very interested in what you had to say. And she said, this is a, 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 a gift. She's a member of the Book of the Month Club, and this is a bonus book that they give. And she didn't want it, but she thought you would really like it, and she wanted to give it to you. And that moment changed my entire life, the whole course of my life, and in fact influenced this talk, the first hour of this talk that I've given tonight. And the book was a collection of writings. I don't even remember the name of it. But at the back of the book, there was a 57-page essay called The Whole Man, W-H-O-L-E, The Whole Man. And I was already admitted to the doctoral program, and I was going to study behaviorism, Skinner, research, how mice behave and things like that. And I read that essay by Abraham Maslow, and I went to my advisor, Dr. Mildred Peters, that evening, and I said, I want to study and, and major in self-actualization therapy and teaching people how they can become reach their ultimate highest place in their life and she said but you've already been accepted under this program but Mildred Peters was one of those people who could just get things done she was a PhD this was 1960 there weren't very many women PhDs in the in the mid 1960s at universities full professors she was the only one <laughs> At, uh, in the whole college there. And people listened to her. And she had brass, you know what, she was like tough. I, and she pulled all the strings to get me to reverse it and allowed me to write my dissertation and, and study a whole different approach. And it was because of one simple little quantum moment of a girl, a high school girl, just handing me this book, changed everything in my life. And I began to think about 
what human beings can do and what we can become and how great, how much greatness we have within us. So I'm going to shift now to um, something else. And then when I, after this next section, I'm going to go into what I did in October, which is just mind blowing. And I don't want you to get too tired. I know it's a Friday night. Many of you have been working. So stay alert here because it's going to get really booga booga. I'm sure most of you know, because it's been all over the news, that, uh, you know, ABC News followed me around for a long time and uh, did a report on me, and I'm sure many of you know that I have leukemia. And um, I've known about it for about a year now. But I don't say that anyplace else but just to use it as an example, because I don't have leukemia. My body does. And that's a very big distinction, okay? And my body is not going to have it much longer. Even though everywhere and everything that people send me from the medical community say that it's incurable, it seems to be not that way for me. There are eight markers for leukemia, and um, my last uh, set of tests, two of them are back to normal, so I've got six to go. But I brought someone here with me tonight to speak to you for 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so that could really change your life. So listen up big time. This is a very big moment. Some of you maybe remember when I, uh, if you've come to these over the years, remember when I brought Immaculate Ilabagiza here from Rwanda to tell her story, and I wrote the foreword to her book called Left to Tell, in which I told her about Viktor Frankl and how he had survived to tell and how she had survived in a bathroom with uh, seven other women for 91 days amidst against all odds. Today, her star shines big, and she talks all over the country, and very, 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 very proud to have uh, brought her to the attention of the world, and I'm doing it again tonight. The day that I found out that I had leukemia was a bizarre day for me. I didn't go in there because I was sick. I didn't go looking for some kind of a diagnosis. Um, I just happened to, they just, uh, at, at this doctor's office that I had gone into because he was just doing sort of a physical kind of thing. And they took blood and he called me in and told me that I had this disease. And um, I just thought that he'd made a mistake. I've been helping people with cancer for years and I just never thought that I, I just don't do cancer. You know, I just don't. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm in good shape, I, do, I, I don't eat meat, I exercise, I, I do all of the things that you're supposed to do, and I meditate, and I don't do, I just don't, that's not possible. So I had the results sent to several places, <laughs> but uh, it turns out that it was absolutely confirmed that I have uh, CLL, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which if you're going to have leukemia is the, is the nicest thing to say about it is the nicest kind of leukemia you can have. It's not life-threatening, but because uh, that's because my life can't be threatened. So um, that day, I um, came back to my my place where I live on Maui, Kanapali Beach, and I was just kind of I was in shock to have this kind of thing because I didn't feel bad. I didn't, you know, it's like, you know, what's different? I just now you've got leukemia in your blood. You know, you've got cancer in your blood. I, would, I don't even know what it meant. And that day, as uh, God would have it, two women were uh, on Maui to talk to me about an integrative approach to medicine, and they had been using um, my works, particularly The Power of Intention, the one I just mentioned, and uh, Inspiration, the Tao books, and so on, and they really wanted to see if I would be willing to cooperate with them in their integrative approach to medicine. A woman worked with uh, Andy Weil. Many of you, I'm sure, know Andy Weil. He's right here in, in Phoenix or Scottsdale someplace. He's nearby here. Tucson. That's all the same. Uh, <laughs> it is. Everything is the same. It's all the same. <laughs> Don't get attached. Don't get attached to your staff. <laughs> I think it's the greatest lesson you have to learn. It's the lesson I've had to learn now at 70, which is how to love without attachment. More about that later. Everything that I've experienced in my life has become part of what I speak about, from living in an orphanage to my addictions in my life to uh, divorce to all of it. So... Um, that day, these two ladies, they knew where I lived, and they'd written me a letter and, and wanted to talk to me. And I said what I always say, uh, maybe, but if it works out and, if, you know, whatever. Basically hoping that it wouldn't because there's just so much of that in my life, so much of that. And I went out to walk that day at a time when I don't normally walk. And I uh, normally, when I walk out, I turn right out of the door and uh, 
go on a different walk. And I wanted to be alone. I just wanted to be alone. But instead, for that reason, for some reason, because there are just, this is just no accidents. I mean, the one thing you can count on is that there are no accidents in this universe. This is a universe that is organized by a divine intelligence that we're all a part of. And none of us can escape that. So um, I turned left, and here were these two ladies sitting on my lawn, stalking me. No, not really. <laughs> and... They started talking to me. One's name was Kim Evans, and the other's name was Pam McDonald. And they started talking to me about this integrative approach to medicine and how they use my work with their patients. And uh, they're both nurse practitioners. They have their own practice. They do. They write prescriptions. They're like doctors. You know, they write their own prescriptions. They have huge practice and so on. And I just, just finally, I just, I guess I must have looked a little weary, or teary, or something. And I said, uh, I broke down. And I just said, you know, an hour ago, I found out that I have leukemia. And Pam said, uh, well, now I know why we're here. We certainly aren't here to talk about an integrated approach. We're here to, I'm here to help you, and I can help you. And I listened. And she began to tell me about something that um, I had never heard of called the uh, APO gene thing. And she was telling me about genetics and, and, and the food that you eat. And the food that you eat is... Uh, you know, it's like we're in a huge crisis in this country. We're in a huge crisis. There are three major big crises. One is the food we eat, you know, with these GMOs and, uh, and this chronic obesity crisis that we have going on. One out of every three children obese in our country. We have another huge crisis on pharmaceuticals. So, you know, in, in 19, you want to hear an alarming statistic? In 1970, there were two billion prescription pills, individual pills, swallowed in America in 1970, 2 billion pills. One generation later, in 2007, there are 113 billion tablets consumed in one new generation. Think of what that is from 2 billion to 113 billion. We're becoming a nation of addicts, people who are addicted to, and I, I know it's in my family. So for every congressman in Washington, there are four lobbyists for the pharmaceutical industry, four for every congressman. That's how big this is. The airwaves are just filled with nothing but prescriptions for prescription drugs, advertisements for prescription drugs. We're the only country in the world that allows that. No other country allows them to be telling the average public to go to your doctor and ask for this drug. When you think about it, it monopolizes, I don't have to tell you, it monopolizes the airwaves. So we've got a, a huge crisis going on there. The average amount of sugar consumed in the United States in 1900 was 18 grams a day. Today it's almost 300. It's a crisis. And Pam said to me, I want to find out what your genetic blueprint is and then devise a diet for you to show you how you can transcend not only this leukemia, but the heart disease that I had had and, and, uh, and so on. And she didn't say any more, but she arranged to have my blood taken. She flew at her own expense to me to deliver the results and to put me on a whole new approach. I'm not going to say any more, more about it because she's much more eloquent and knowledgeable about it. But I found out later that she had self-published a book that she had written before. She didn't even tell me this until six months later. And I took it to Louise Hay at Hay House and said, I'm going to write the foreword to this book. Because when I went on the program that was designed for me, based upon genetically who I am, what I inherited from my parents, 23 pounds went off just like that, and my markers started to shift on the leukemia. I mean, you can just see the difference. I mean, if you can't, I can. I see it every day. And I'm probably healthier than I've been in the last 25 years. Feel great. Enormous amount of energy. Thank you. And I wrote the forward to her book and had it published myself to make sure. It's called The Perfect Gene Diet, and it is spectacular. It has made a huge impact on me. Now for the good stuff. <laughs> this uh, beginning of October, in preparation for that, I began to uh, look at this whole concept of being able to manifest and attract into our lives the things that we really want. In other words, to fulfill our, our heart's desire. And I came across some just fascinating things. I brought the Bible with me, and there are two passages that I want to read from the Bible. Because what I've learned in what I did uh, in that whole month of October in reading uh, Three Magic Words, have any of you read Three Magic Words? Yeah, it's a total life changer for me. And uh, something called the I Am Discourses. The I Am Discourses. I Am Discourses. I'm going to make you familiar with it in a few moments. But um, basically, the question that I want to ask you that... Um, Philosophy, and I was a philosophy uh, major for a while and taught philosophy metaphysics at the university, is the question we all think about is, you know, who are we and where did we come from? Basic question, who am I? So if you ask yourself the question, who am I, who is this I, when I use the pronoun I, 
who am I? You begin to realize after a while that you, it does, you know, there's not an easy answer to that. You don't get to say, I am this body, because we know that um, how many bodies have you been in since you, since you were born? You know, the I, that is you. How many, how many bodies have you been in? Let's see, you were in a body this big, right? Then you were in a toddler body. Then you were in a seven-year-old body. Then a 13-year-old body. And then a teenage body that did this kind of thing like my girls always do, you know. And, so, and you were in a 20-year-old and a 25-year-old. And the body that you're in is this constantly shifting energy system that um, is changing. Muktananda once said that, uh, he was asked the question, what is real? And he said, that is real, which never changes. So what part of you lives up to the definition of what is real? Certainly it's not your body, because the I that was in that, uh, say, two-year-old body, where is that body now? Where is the two-year-old body that you were in? Is it, is it, is it gone? Is it uh, evaporated? Has it disappeared? Is it, uh, did it ever exist? Because you go into men, the I that you are, the I that is I enters a new body, then another body, and another body all the time. And the I continues to stay consistent and unchanging. But the thing that it occupies just keeps changing. So you're not this body. So if you're not this body, who is this I that you are? Hi there. My name is Liz Dawn, and I am the co-creator of Celebrate Your Life events. And I hope you're loving this amazing workshop with the late and great Dr. Wayne Dyer. This was recorded live at one of our Celebrate Your Life conferences. And I'm so excited that we could share this very special workshop with all of the Evan Carmichael fans. And to learn more about us, just click the link below and visit CelebrateYourLife.com. And that was the thing I wanted to explore and, and, and really look at. As you begin to realize that this body that you're in, even the body that you came into this room two hours ago, when you leave it an hour from now, when you leave this room, you will be in a different body than you were in when you were, uh, you know, philosophically, metaphysically, I don't have to say that very well to this audience because you all know that. You've all studied this kind of thing. You wouldn't be at this kind of a conference if you didn't know that. That who you are is that which never changes. And so that coming into contact with that part of you that never changes is really the secret. It's such a profound knowing and teaching, and it's so simple, but if you get it and realize that all that you would like to attract into your life, all that you would like to manifest for yourself is going to come to you when you stop identifying yourself with something that isn't real. And the something that isn't real, we know that consciousness is not in the body. If consciousness was in your body and you cut your leg off, you'd lose your consciousness, or certainly you'd lose a portion of it, wouldn't you? But it isn't work that way at all. As I was examining this and looking at this, somebody sent me a book. And the book is, uh, well, here's the letter that they sent. I get very excited about this. So here's the letter. It was sent to the yoga studio on Maui, and I was gone. I was off the island for a, a couple of months. And when I came back, the yoga the teacher handed me this little package. It was wrapped in gold, and it had a, a gold-colored ribbon on it. Now, I get books by the hundreds, by the thousands, from publishers, from authors, and most of them I just have to give away. I, I can't certainly can't read them all, so I just, every once in a while, donate them to libraries or to prisons or what, whatever, just maybe give 500 books away at a time. But this little gift just sat there on my table where I eat in the evening. I looked at it for a week and then another week, and I thought, why don't, why don't I open that? and just get rid of it. It's just one more book that I've got that I've got to look at, and uh, something wouldn't let me do it. So I finally, one day, I took the ribbon off, and I opened it up, and I thought, oh, it's another one of these. It's like a channeled book, and uh, everybody's got a channeled book. Everybody's doing the Course in Miracles, their own Course in Miracles. So this letter is in there from this lady. Her name is uh, Carol Ann Jacobs. Her phone number is 828, never mind. And it says, this is the note that it said, it said, this gift of gold is a pearl of the highest wisdom on the planet, handed down through the ethers from the octave of light. If taken up, used, and made as a living flame within oneself, it will lead them into their ascension at the close of this embodiment. With sincere love and gratitude for all the raising of the vibration you have done for mankind, for the earth, and for all the beings of the elements, lovingly, Carol and Jacobs. So that's, yeah, that's a pretty big claim, all right? 
And so I look at this little thing, and I open it up, and it turns out that it's uh, in 1932. It says here, the 33 discourses contained in this book were dictated over a visible light and sound ray in our home during 1932 by the Ascended Master St. Germain and those other Ascended Masters directly concerned with this activity. The sound of his voice was physically audible to everyone in the room. At times, his visible, tangible presence also stood within the room, and everyone saw them and heard it. So, again, more stuff, all right? And I set it down, and I thought, all of the wisdom of the world? <laughs> it's in this little tiny thing here. It's, a, it's 300 and some pages, but the little pages. And I thought, all right, I'll, I'll just, for some reason, every once in a while, there's something, and I just take it, and I started reading this. My whole life changed. I began manifesting things that I had never experienced before. I began to see things showing up that I put my attention on that had never happened before. And I didn't fully grasp it. At this point, I started talking about it a little bit on my radio show, and it's called the I Am Discourses. Now, I'm going to just read to you just a little bit of the very first one, page two. We may have to stay till midnight. We have to keep you here till you get this, all right? So don't go falling asleep on me. The discourse, this is the very first one in this group. Life in all of its activities, everywhere manifest, says St. Germain, is God in action. And it is only through lack of the understanding of applied thought and feeling that mankind is constantly interrupting the pure flow of that perfect essence of life, which would, without interference, naturally express its perfection everywhere. The natural tendency of life is love, peace, beauty, harmony, and opulence. For life cares not who uses it, but is constantly surging to pour more of its perfection into manifestation, always with that lifting process which is ever inherent within itself. I am. Now get these two words. No two words, says U.S. Anderson, put together have more magnificence and potential for your greatness than these two words, I am. I am is the activity of that life. How strange it is that students with sincere interest do not seem to get the true meaning of those two words. When you say and feel, I am, you release the spring of eternal, everlasting life to flow on its way unmolested. In other words, you open wide the door to its natural flow. When you say, I am not, you shut the door in the face of this mighty energy. I am is the full activity of God. Having placed before you so often the truth of God in action, I wish you to understand its first expression in individualization. The first expression of every individual everywhere in the universe, either in spoken word, silent thought, or feeling is, I am, recognizing its own conquering divinity. The student all of us, including me, endeavoring to understand and apply these mighty yet simple laws must stand guard more strictly over his thought and expression in word or otherwise. For every time you say, I am not, or I cannot, or I have not, you are, whether knowingly or unknowingly, throttling that great presence within you. So it's why when I came out here, I don't say, I am sick. That's not possible. Because the minute that you say, I am sick, you stop, you throttle, you hold back, and you don't even want to add a word to I am. So I want to go to the Bible. I was reading the Bible upstairs in my room, and I brought the one from my room down here, okay, placed by the Gideons. Now, I knew what I was going to read. <laughs> so we go to the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. And this is Exodus. And this is 3,500 years old, a 1,000 years before Lao Tzu. And it is one of the oldest, spiritual teachings on the planet, surviving, the Torah, the Old Testament, Exodus. And the story is of Moses talking to a burning bush that never, that doesn't have a bush. The bush just keeps, uh, it just keeps burning and burning and it doesn't disintegrate. Moses is talking to God, supposedly, from the Torah. I think of the, of the poet, uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, married to Robert Browning in the 1860s. Earth's crammed with heaven, she said, and every burning bush a fire with God. And those who truly know take off their shoes while the rest sit round and pick blackberries. <laughs> That's from Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Earth's crammed with heaven. So Moses supposedly is talking to God. And Moses says these two, I'm going to read two verses. He says, this is Exodus 3.13. Then Moses says to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. I am is God. And when you say those words, now we lurch forward several thousand years and go to the New Testament. And here is Jesus speaking in John 8:58. And Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was I am. Now, it may not mean much to you when you hear those words, but it may soon. Because I've read every word. There's 347 pages in here. And in each one of these discourses from these ascended masters, supposedly, whether you believe it's coming from another source, I happen to believe that everything is channeled, especially writing. I mean, I sit and write, and I don't have a typewriter, and I don't have a computer. I just let the words come. Now, where are they coming from? Even the words now that are coming to me to say to you right here, where are they coming? Do I own them? Uh, are they mine? Are they some? They're coming from the mind of God, which all of us are a part of. So, as as you think about these two words, and I'm going to give you a meditation, and as you do this meditation, I actually read about this in another Hay House book, it's called The Moses Code, written by James Twyman, and he talks about this, uh, and I've been doing this, um, this meditation for two or three months now, and what is said in here, over and over again, there's one other page, I just want, one other thing I want to read to you from this, I could go on, I mean I did, whoops, so don't worry, the student should constantly look within his human self and see what habits or creations are there that need to be plucked out and disposed of. For only by refusing to any longer allow habits of judging, condemning, and criticizing to exist can he be free. The true activity of the student is only to perfect his own world, and he cannot do it as long as he sees imperfection in the world of another of God's children. So that the ability to manifest starts with your willingness to let go of any thoughts that you have that are of condemning, criticizing, judging, or finding fault with any other human being. You have to be free of that because when you are recognizing what the three magic words, the book that um, U.S. Anderson wrote, and it reminds me of Castaneda because there's no pictures of Anderson and he has no biography in, in his story. And I had this book in my library years ago, but I didn't really grasp, but I, I knew what the three magic words were, and I want to say them to you, because you don't get them until the 12th chapter of three magic words, and I brought it down with me to share it with you, say it to you exactly as he said it. This is the ineffable secret, the ultimate illumination. This is after 12 chapters, 12 meditations at the end of every chapter. I spent five or six hours a day in this, looking at thinking and thought and spirituality and consciousness and basically was going to try to teach a seminar on how to be able to manifest using this concept because the I am discourses just shifted my life around. I began to say, this is the ineffable secret, the ultimate illumination, the key to peace and power. You are God. If you will accept this towering truth and dare to stand atop this magnificent pinnacle, universal consciousness will be revealed to you from within. God is there. It is he who peers from behind your eyes, who is your own consciousness, who is your very self. You are not just a part of God. You are altogether God, and God is altogether you. Can you say that? I mean, can you really understand this? When you say, I am... See, when Moses spoke to God and God said, you tell them that I am sent you, it didn't say, I will be. Because the words, I will be, mean, I am not yet. And God can only say, the only thing that God can say is, I am. The minute that he adds anything to it, the minute that God adds anything to I am, it takes away from being God. I am tall, I am short, I am male, I am American, I am from Phoenix and not Tucson, I am from, okay, it's the I am, the I, so getting used to this, so before that I've been studying something else, I'm, I'm just so excited about this, <laughs> because I have found miraculous, miraculous things happening in my life, so I have to share one other thing, it's from the White Brotherhood. Now, this is not white skin, okay? <laughs> this is white light, all right? The white light brotherhood. And this is what started me on the path. It was given to me by a dear friend. Listen to this. The higher self. You've heard lots and lots of talk about it. Our higher self, the highest place within you, the part of you that is not your body, the part of you that just keeps entering new bodies all the time, that was in little bodies, bigger bodies, teenage bodies, 20-year-old bodies, is going to be in a body, an older body, and ultimately is going to leave this body. Our higher self, now really hear this, 
Our higher self is perfect, omniscient, and almighty, a fragment of God himself, a pure, transparent, luminescent quintessence. Yes, but if this is so, how is it that this self allows us to make mistakes? It is this that is so difficult to understand. How can there be a being within us who sees and knows everything, is all-powerful, and yet who is totally unmoved, who never feels or expresses any pain, whatever we do? Why does he accept situations that are not in his best interest? And when we speak to him of our philosophy and our dreams and our hopes and our plans, why does he do nothing to put them into effect? We are not separated from him, and yet when we are suffering, and trying to improve the situation, he remains coldly indifferent and leaves us to our plight. Is there no way of touching him? It is very important to get to know this higher self, for he is so far above our own being that when he does decide to act, nothing is impossible for him. The only problem is in getting him to act, and we don't know how to make him want what we want. It's a problem that can reach tragic proportions in our lives. How can we spark the goodwill of this being who is so far above us and whom we represent so inadequately here on earth? And then he says, he only begins to notice us and give us his attention when we finally decide we want to get to know him or get to know her. If you can make a decision to want to get to know the I am that is you and begin to understand what Anderson said at the conclusion of his book. You know, there's a, another one other book. I'm going to talk about Neville and his approach to manifesting very shortly. I have read the book called The, the uh, Power of Awareness seven times, cover to cover, underlined it, written notes about it. I have a copy of it up here by Neville. I gave it to every one of my children for Christmas a couple of years ago and talked to them about it. It's one of those books where you read a paragraph and there's an aha in every sentence. You'll see because I'm going to talk about it. I've memorized it. All right, I know the book. And yet, after seven readings, and I read it just two weeks ago, just before I did that seminar again, five chapters a day. Each The chapters are two, three pages long. It's not a great big undertaking. It is so powerful in terms of being able to find out the God within you. The one other thing that the Creator has planted within every creature a fragment of Himself, a spark, a spirit of the same nature as Himself. And thanks to this spirit, every creature can become a Creator. And this means that instead of always waiting for their needs to be satisfied by some external source, human beings can work inwardly by means of their thoughts that will and their will and their spirit to obtain the nourishing healing element they need. The Creator has placed a spark of Himself in every one of us. My goal for myself at this time in my life is to take that speck of the higher self, the I am that I am, that is in me that I came from, the God that I am, and make it a fragment. And take that fragment and make it a segment. And make that segment maybe this large so that the God that is within me, that, if you heard what I just said, knows everything, is all-powerful. There's a piece of you inside of you, beyond this thing of yours that's called the ego, that is all-knowing and capable of attracting and manifesting anything in your life. And the name of it is I Am. Tell them I Am sent there. You came from that. And when you get that, when you know that you are God, that God isn't some external thing that you pray to, which has been preached at us by religion since the beginning of time and why so many people kill each other in the name of it over and over again. Because the truth is really a truth until you organize it. And then it becomes a lie because it's the organization that we become obsessed with. Gandhi was asked about Christians and he said, I love your Christ. He said, but I don't know about your Christians. He says, it seems that your Christians don't know their Christ. That was from Gandhi. So try to imagine for yourself a place within yourself that is God. Now this little book that I was telling you about called The Power of Awareness that is like something that I have been immersed in for a very long time. It looks like this by Neville. So I open it up to read it for the seventh time just before I do this two-day seminar. And guess what the name of the first chapter is, and I never knew it before. I am. And it goes like this. The light is consciousness. This is the opening chapter, I am. Consciousness is one, manifesting in legions of forms or levels of consciousness. There is no one that is not all that is. For consciousness, though expressed in an infinite series of levels, is not divisional. You can't divide it. There is no real separation or gap in consciousness. I am cannot be divided. Now, I'm going to read you the very last chapter. It's only a little over a page. Very short. And then move into the uh, manifesting thing. Last chapter of this book after, and you can see, there's notes 
all over this place. Let these words in. In all creation, in all eternity, in all the realms of your infinite being, the most wonderful fact is that which is stressed in the first chapter of this book. You are God. You are the I am that I am. You are consciousness. You are the creator. There is, this is the mystery, this is the great secret known by the seers and prophets and mystics throughout the ages. This is the truth that you can never know intellectually. Who is this you? That is, you, John Jones or Mary Smith, is absurd. It is the consciousness which knows that you are John Jones or Mary Smith. It is your greater self, your deeper self, your infinite being. Call it what you will. The important thing is that it is within you. It is you. It is your world. It is this fact that underlies the immutable law of assumption. It is upon this fact that your very existence is built. It is this fact that is the foundation of every chapter of this book. No, you cannot know this intellectually. You cannot debate it. You cannot substantiate it. You can only feel it. You can only be aware of it. Becoming aware of it, one great emotion permeates your being. You live with a perpetual feeling of reverence. The knowing that your creator is the very self of yourself and never would have made you had he not loved you must fill your heart with devotion and with adoration. One knowing glimpse of the world about you at any single instant of time is sufficient to fill you with profound awe and a feeling of worship. As Rumi said, sell your cleverness and purchase bewilderment. Now... When you know that you are God, that a tiny little piece of you is placed in you, and you begin to use these words, I am, you stop with the I am not, and I can't have, and I must not, and begin to see yourself as this divine spark. And as you use this meditation, and this is the meditation that I use, you say whatever it is that you would like to attract into your life, a great job, a great relationship, a body that is in perfect health, whatever it might be, write it down, put it in words, whatever you would like to manifest, whatever it might be, write it out and keep it next to where you meditate. And then use this mantra for 20 minutes. And the mantra is, I am that. That was Nisargadatta Maharaj's biography. Nisargadatta Maharaj told me when that book was out, he said, you don't have to read it. He said, carry it with you. And the energy from when the pages of this book, and he didn't write it, it was a book about, about his teachings, dialogues. He said, by just carrying it with you, the truth of it will come to you. And I thought he's just another crazy old man back in the 1980s. And then I began to understand what that meant, that there's energy in everything. And I say this about the Tao. Many of you know the story, and I was going to tell it tonight, but somehow I told something else tonight. Of when I was 65 and I left everything behind, gave away all everything I had, all the clothes I had, all the books I had, my house, everything. I just gave it all away and lived the Tao Te Ching for one full year. 81 verses, four and a half days on each verse, and wrote an essay on each one of them called Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life. But then we put out the Tao itself. And I say to you, carry the Tao with you wherever you go. Put it in your purse. Put it in your glove box. The Tao, Tao means the great way, T-A-O. T-E means the virtue of. Ching means book in ancient Chinese. The book of living the virtue of the great way. Just carry it with you and open it up every now and then and just read something from it. And we have an affirmation next to it if you want to use this edition. There are many editions of it. And the Tao can... You know, some call it the wisest book ever written. And I could go into the changes that took place in my life by living the Tao, but they're nothing compared to what the I Am Discourses have done for me. The I Am Discourses have taught me, as did uh, Three Magic Words and the Power of Awareness, taught me to once and for all not just intellectually know it, but to feel it, the divinity that I am. You know, when I first started on the I Am Discourses, so many things began to happen. Somebody sent me this necklace in the mail. I hadn't even talked yet about the I Am uh, Discourses. And it says, on one side, I am, and on the other side, it says, divine. It just arrived in the mail the same day that I began to, the very same day that I began reading the I am discourses and what they meant to me. And there's 33 of those discourses. And um, they're teachings of healing that, I mean, my whole body has changed, not only in addition to what Pam has done, but I am just a totally different person. I am so at peace and so humble and so aligned with a knowing that, I can enlarge this spark to a larger portion of my life till ultimately I can get to a place of being, just being love, just being it.
which I saw with my teacher Ramdas just uh, last weekend. So that as you begin to use this meditation, now here's your mantra: I am that. Whatever you have written out on that paper, I am that already. And then that's on the out breath. I am that into yourself, and on the in breath. I am. I am that is the spark of God within you. The I am is God, the entire being of God coming back at you. I am that. I am. I am that. I am. Read the Moses Code, and it's explained a little bit more clearly. And as you begin to say these words, just even saying the two words "I am," you are saying the name of the Creator, and it sparks within you a realization that that's you. That your highest self, your highest self, not this ego. Now the ego is the part of us that comes to believe that who we are is something different than what we were when we were conceived and brought into this world. In the first nine months inside of your mother's womb, there was nothing for you to do. You just allowed. I am took over. What can your mother do? What can anyone? Do? There's a divine, invisible intelligence that is allowing everything to just take place. The child is born. We hold this beautiful baby in our hands, which was divinely conceived and is whatever intelligence. Lao Tzu called it the Tao. Some call it God. Some call it Spirit, Divine Mind, whatever it is. Was just taking care of everything, as Lao Tzu said. You're doing nothing. You're just being done. Just allow it. Just allow. And then comes what we call the false self. And the false self is a whole new teaching. The Course in Miracles has this great line. In it about your ego. Your ego is the part of you that believes that who you are is what you have and what you do and what you, other people think of you. Your ego is the part of you that believes that you're separate from everybody else, that you have to compete, that you're separate from what's missing in your life, and that you're separate from God, which is impossible. That's the ego. It's the false self. And this is what the Course in Miracles says about your ego. This fragment of your mind is such a tiny part of it that could you but appreciate the whole, you would see instantly that it is like the smallest sunbeam to the sun, or like the faintest ripple on the surface of the ocean. In its amazing arrogance, this tiny little sunbeam has decided. That it is the sun. This almost imperceptible ripple hails itself as the ocean. Think how alone and frightened is that little thought. This infinitesimally small illusion holding itself apart against the universe. Do not accept this little fenced-off aspect of yourself as yourself. The sun and the ocean itself are as nothing beside what you are, because you are God. And for some people who would hear this, they would say it's blasphemy, and that、um, you know that that's like a very high ego thing to say I am God. Now I'm not saying to you go out and anybody who says anything to you say excuse me, but <clears throat> I am God. You know, I, it's I am God in the sense of what else could I be? Where did I come from? I had to come from this invisible divine source. So Neville says that if you really want to understand how to manifest into your life, there are seven. Things that I have put together from my reading of of Neville and what I have been able to manifest, and everything that I have said to myself that I have written down and tried this and said, I am that, I am, I am that, I am. Remember, when you say the words "I am," you're giving the name of God. So this is really your highest self's name, God. So the first of these is called your imagination. Your imagination is the greatest gift that you have ever been given. Everything that ever was created into this world, from non-form into form, started in the imagination. You cannot create without having something in your imagination. Your imagination is that part of you. That is that invisible place that no one else gets to enter. It's yours. You can put anything there that you want. And in your imagination, I'm asking you to put in your imagination what it is that you would like to have for yourself in your life. How you would like this life of yours to go. How you would like your relationships to be. How you would like your health to be. How you would like your prosperity to show up. Put it into your imagination. It's yours. William Blake had this wonderful line about imagination: to see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, to hold eternity in the palm of your hand and infinity in an hour. We are all led to believe a lie when we see with, not through the eye, which was born in a night to perish in a night, while the soul slept in beams of light. That's how powerful the imagination is, and nobody can take it away from you. And everything that you look around at in this physical world was once imagined. Everything has to start with a thought in your imagination. So to 
see this as a powerful gift. Again, when Thoreau was at Walden Pond, as I told you earlier, he wrote in his essay on the necessity of disobedience the definition of success that I memorized when I was in high school. He said, if you advance confidently in the direction of your own dreams and endeavor to live the life which you have imagined, those are two key words, you will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. That is, when you start living from the place of your dreams and your imagination, success isn't something that you will have to chase after. After, it will chase after you. It will show up in your life in a myriad of ways. So your imagination is this powerful tool of yours, and we don't use it very well. And we don't realize, and I had a whole bunch of stuff that I was going to do on, on thought and, and think, because most of us really believe that we think our thoughts, and all we have to do is learn somehow to control these thoughts that we think. But the truth is, Anderson puts it this way. I, I have to read you this. It's just, it's too good. All right. It's one little section in three magic words. Just a few words to this. As human beings, he says, we have been tricked into believing that we think. In other words, we believe we make thoughts. It is a peculiar thing that we believe this since no one has ever been able to say whence a thought comes and from what it is made. But nevertheless, most treatises on the mind hold that man thinks up things and makes up thoughts. Isn't that pretty much what we've all think about when we have all of these thoughts? Yet, if you carefully analyze the process of thought, you will find that it is not you who thinks at all, but it is rather you who observes thoughts as they flit across your consciousness. Stated differently, it is as if the real you occupied a still and guarded position in the very recesses of your being from which you observe a purely mental world that consists entirely of thoughts. These thoughts parade across your consciousness in a never-ending stream, following one upon the other unceasingly. Some you select and add to you, others you reject and send on their way. But the plain and irrevocable fact is that it is not you who sets the stream of thoughts in motion. If you doubt this, then try to stop it. And there's more, but I'll stop there. So here's how I look at this process of thought. You know how on CNBC uh, there's this little, and on the, all the sports channels, there's this little ribbon always going by, and it's like, you know, they got you. It's, it's, you have to you watch the news, and they got a picture over here, and then they got something that you, so you're watching, and then you're trying to read. What does this say under here? Oh, my God, I just missed what was said over there. What's this picture over here, you know? So think about that ribbon. Now, this is really good. Think about the ribbon, and think about this is just like, all the thoughts that are thought are not your thoughts. They're thoughts of God. Every one of them. And they're just trillions of them. And they just keep, they're going and going. And this ribbon never stops. And you know this. Even when you're meditating, you get to be the best meditator ever. You start thinking about how a good meditator you are. You know, it's like, you just, you just can't stop the damn thoughts. And it's like, oh my God, did I turn off? I can't hold from my, did I turn the, did I leave the refrigerator? Oh my, did I turn my car? Oh my God. And it's like, what, what am I thinking that for? Do you do this? I mean, well, am I the only one? Of course not. It's this continuous bombardment of thoughts. So here come thoughts and they're always coming and they're never going to stop. What you get to do, the I am that you are, is you get to decide which ones you want and which ones you don't want. So as a thought goes by, and let's say you've just broken up with someone and you're depressed, or let's say that you've lost your job, or let's say you just found out that your partner cheated on you, or your kids just uh, failed algebra, I don't know, anything. Your daughter lost her virginity or something, you know, something that's just, you know, is, is annoying to you or hurt for you. So, so here comes, here come they, here they come, and they're going by and they're going by, and it's like, you say, oh, that pissed me off, oh, that... And you decide now which thoughts you're going to pick and which ones you're not going to pick. Because out of these thoughts come your feelings. And it is these feelings that determine everything about your health. So you start getting good at remembering that you don't want to think about things that you don't want. So you let that one go, you let that one go, until a thought comes there that you want to grab a hold of. And you replace these individual thoughts that are so negative and painful and cause you to be hurt and cause your blood pressure to go up and cause, and cause all kinds of disease processes to take place in your body, cause fatigue, cause worry, cause anxiety, cause cancer, cause whatever, all of these, these endless thoughts, you start replacing the thoughts, even just if you just do it three or four times a day, you just pick a different one. It's just they're going to keep on going by. And if you pick one and it just really bothers you and hurts you and you're sad or you're depressed, you just give it back and you just wait for another one. And you put on top of the feeling or the thought in there that is upsetting to you, you put on top of that something that is pleasant. A beautiful thought of sunrise, the last time you, you made love that was so 
perfect. The, when you're out swimming in the ocean and that sea turtle, which I swim with almost every day, there's four or five sea turtles I swim with. They're so graceful and they're so magnificent, these huge things, and they, they're so enlightened because they, they're always at home. They take their home wherever they go. <laughs> there they go. That's a, so you just put turtles there or you put whatever, and you begin to pick and select. You, you get selective about the kind of thoughts that you have, and as you do that, your health starts to change and your prosperity starts to change as well. So I could do a lot on this, but your imagination is the key. The second of these seven things is to learn to live from the end rather than about the end. To whatever it is that you place into your imagination, to be able to hold it there and place your attention on that rather than on what you see out here in the, in the rest of the world, in your physical world. You act, I call it acting as if. And this is where you say the words, I am. And, you know, I am wealthy. I am happy. I am well. I am kind. I am love. I am God. That is your I amness. You're just referring to the qualities. I call them in the power of intention, the faces of intention. And as you place your attention on these, uh, and you start to live from the end rather than thinking about the end, only in your imagination. Because if you stay there, what you have in your imagination has to manifest, especially if since you're God, and the I Am Discourse is one of the things I like best about it is you don't ask for anything. You're not asking God to do something for you. You're not asking for any special favors. You're demanding it. You're insisting about it. God doesn't have to ask if it's okay. I insist that this manifest. I intend that this will be a part of my life. This is something that I am absolutely creating. This isn't something that I hope. And you don't go in your prayer work to God and ask God to understand your conflicts. And the Course in Miracles, it says, well, I've got it written out. It's even better. <laughs> I think the last thing I have to read. <laughs> Listen to this. The memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. A mind at war with itself remembers not eternal gentleness. The memory of God comes to the quiet mind. It cannot come where there is conflict. Why is that so? God is oneness. You remember earlier, you cannot divide this thing called God. You can't divide it up. It's oneness. In the shift book, that was the hardest thing that I had to write. This whole idea of understanding oneness because we always think of two-ness. So if you pray to God to solve your conflicts and God were to acknowledge your conflicts, God would no longer be God because God oneness cannot represent two-ness or recognize or know anything about it. That's why it says a mind at war with itself remembers not eternal gentleness. Conflict is something that isn't in the mind of God. If oneness says, okay, you got conflict, in order to have conflict, you have to have what? Two, don't you? So it must be something that you're in conflict with. Oneness can't represent, can't recognize two-ness, because if it did, oneness would now become two-ness. It can't know anything about that. So praying to God to solve your conflicts, total waste of your energy, total waste of time. What you want to do is become that and say to yourself, I am God. I am God. This is, this is who I am. This is hard because there's people in here I know who are going, well, that's, that's just blasphemy. That's a meme. That you, I mean, religion is just filled with endless kinds of memes, you know, that we have a tendency to think are really true when in fact, you know, if you really just look at this, it's not possible. It's not possible for you to be anything other than what you came from. And oneness is what you are. That's where you want to go. Now, as long as you're in a body and you have an ego, there's going to be dichotomies. There's going to be these shifts, you know, but you're working at understanding the oneness. There's a place within you where oneness runs rampant. And that's where you want to go. So you think from the end. The third thing is what Neville calls, this is probably the greatest sentence in The Power of Assumption, assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled. This is so good when you get it, that you have placed into your mind what it is you want to attract. You are thinking from the end. This is who you are now in your imagination. And you have assumed the feeling of this wish fulfilled. This is what I have done with my leukemia. This is why I don't say to myself, I am sick. I just say, I am. That's enough. I am. And this body is not who I am. I am that which is well. That's how I think. And that's what I know. I feel that in my body. And it isn't until you feel it. You can't think a feeling. The feeling is something that comes to you as a result of you being it experientially in your mind. You feel it in every pore of your body. It feels good. And I've got to add the fourth one here. The fourth one I call the world of attention. So you have decided that you want to be well. 
You have decided that you want to be healthy. You have decided that you want to be prosperous, whatever it might be. You place your attention on that. You think from that end. Now, someone comes along and says, didn't you see that article in the, uh, you know, on USA Today? Didn't you see? You know, people send me this stuff all the time. Here's something that just came off the Internet. It's like CLL is incurable. It says this right here. Every doctor in the country knows that, you know, every oncologist will tell you that CLL is... I had a... Uh, oncologist when I first went to when I found out I had this, this uh, leukemia and I said to him there's a study that was done at the, at the manager clinic which is this place with specialized in, in cancer treatment and they published it in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine about green tea and that people who drink green tea on a regular basis and, and, and so on and it's organic and blah 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 that they've been able to reduce their leukemia down to practically normal rates and my the oncologist sat there and he said uh, green tea is not a treatment for leukemia and so we talked for a little bit longer and then I said but you know this was the manager clinic you know and it's like I mean these are the top doctors in the field and and they reported these amazing results just with green tea and the, what, what, what do you think do you think I should maybe you know, buy a truckload of green tea and just, you know, have green tea in my body all the time? Dr. Dyer, green tea is not a treatment for leukemia. And I left. I just left. I said, but if he doesn't, I've always believed you have to have a mind that's open to everything and attached nowhere. All right, that's from Talopa. Just have a mind that's open. His mind was totally shut off to any part. And it doesn't make any difference whether green tea or not green tea is going to reduce it. The idea that this is a closed-off person, and I'm now working with a spiritual oncologist in, uh, in uh, San Diego, Dr. Dan Vicario. And my last treatment with him was to spend the half a day walking through the Yogananda Gardens down in Carlsbad in California and just breathe in the beauty of where Yogananda lived before he passed away down there in, uh, in San Diego County and just see the flowers and just be out there and just be at peace to bring that into my consciousness. That's the kind of, and he took a half a day just to be with me doing just that. Look at these flowers, look at, that's my treatment. The example I like to give is this, this kid that came up to a kid. He was 39 years old. His name was Vincent and he had chronic stuttering. I mean, he had a really, really bad stuttering problem and he, um, came to me and uh, we were at a, at a mall in Los Angeles and um, he could hardly get the words out like this and he'd been a chronic stutterer since he was four years old and he said to me finally he managed to get out he said he recognized me from public television and he said do you think you could help me only it didn't talk, sound like that and I said um, Vincent I said um, can you imagine yourself not stuttering speaking clearly can you imagine that in your mind he said no I just kind of, I said, and I turned around, my da two daughters were with me, and we, I just walked away from him. And he said, wait, 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 you know, and I was just joking with him. And I came back, and he said, I said, uh, if you can't imagine it, I said, I can't help you. Because everything that you do starts in your imagination. So he said, um, I said, now I want you to try again. Just, it's your imagination. Can't you just place into your imagination the idea that you can speak without stammering? Can you think that? And he closed his eyes. I said, just, so I said, finally, he said, Yes. I said, great. I said, how does it feel? He said, how does what feel? I said, how does it feel to imagine yourself speaking without stuttering? <sighs> he had never worked this hard before. He said, it feels great. I said, that's the feeling that you have to assume. Now, the fourth point that I was talking about is attention. Now, there's two kinds of attention. Subjective attention, objective attention. Objective attention is the tension that everybody will tell you that if you've been stuttering for 35 years, you can't heal yourself of it. It's the attention that you'll, you'll see when, when your, your mother and father will say, well, he's always been that way. There's nothing he can do about it. He's always been a nervous kid, whatever it might be. You're going to hear lots and lots and lots of attention coming your way about what it is that you want to manifest and how impossible it is and that you can't do that. But I said, you want to use subjective attention and subjective of attention is you always go back to in your imagination where you are free of stammering. That's the hard part for most people because most people's minds have been trained to think about what they don't want or what they can't have or what always used to be or even what is or what other people want for you or what the experts say. That's how we use our minds, putting our attention on what we don't want. Why in the world would anyone think about what they don't want if they want to attract what they do want? Like if I gave everyone in this room a million dollars and said, go out to the mall tomorrow and you can use this currency to attract what you want, you can use it to buy anything that you want. You say, great. You go out to the mall, you take the money out there, you see a rug, Persian rug, worth a $100,000 for the rug. And you look 
look at it and you say, that is so hideous. I would never want anything like that in my house. Here's $100,000. Send two of them home. You go to the next store. You see something else that you don't want. Two lamps that match the rugs. And you say, send four of those to my house. $50,000 a piece. You've gone through four hundred grand, and you've used the currency you have to buy what you do want to purchase what you don't want. And you do this all day until the million dollars is gone. Then you go home, and you look at your house and your life, and you say, why is my house filled with all of this stuff that I don't want? And the answer is, you're crazy. <laughs> you're just insane. You've got currency to purchase what you want, and you're spending it on what you don't want. The currency that you have to purchase what you want in your life are your thoughts. And to use them to purchase what you don't want, to think about all that is missing, or what other people tell you you can't have, or what the experts tell you, or what always has been, or even what is, is a complete... Why would anybody come up with this sentence? I hear it all the time. With my luck, things aren't going to work out. Why would we ever think like that? Why would anybody ever come up with that? I don't even know how to process that kind of thinking. Like, my thought always is, everything's going to work out with my luck. Things are going to happen. I've always been a reverse paranoid, not a paranoid. Paranoid is someone who thinks everybody's talking about them and saying bad things about them. I'm a reverse paranoid. I think everybody's talking about me. Why not? But they're saying nice things. So when people are looking, talking about me, I say, of course they're talking about me. They've got nice things to say. Using your mind to put your attention on anything that you don't want or that you can't have is a complete waste of your energy. So... I've talked here about imagination, thinking from the end, assuming the feeling of the wish fulfilled, that is, feeling it in your body, literally feeling it and experiencing it, and then using subjective attention. Every time the subject matter comes up or the thought comes up about what it is that you intend to manifest or create for yourself in your life, every time it comes up, you go to what's in your imagination. That's where you go. You don't go to the facts that are out there. And the fifth thing is called the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind is the part of you that runs most of your life. There's your conscious mind, 5% of your life. 95% of your life is your subconscious mind. Like when you drive, you don't think about, you know, how you're going to turn or how fast you're going to go. I mean, you can drive drive all the way across the desert, all the way through all the different, and never even think about any of it. You just do it because you've gone from conscious to subconscious. Your subconscious mind cannot make a distinction between what you think and what you experience in reality. It's all the same to it. So that if you put your thoughts, and so I'm going to skip ahead now to the sixth one, and that is I call this the last five minutes. And this is the most important thing I'm going to say to you today. This is what you're going to take home tonight with you. The last five minutes of the day when you're in your bed and you're ready to enter your subconscious mind, the last five minutes, you're now going to enter your subconscious mind in the next five minutes. You're getting ready. You're ready. You're getting ready. What are you thinking about? If you are thinking about all the things that went wrong, all the things that you don't like, all the things that you are mad about, all the stuff, and, and using your mind, you are now going to marinate for the next eight hours in your subconscious mind. That's where it takes place, in your sleeping. That's your subconscious mind. And if you enter into it, your subconscious mind says, so, you want more of that same crap that you've been getting all day long? <laughs> You want to be depressed some more? You want to be unhappy? You want to re think about all the things that you don't like and you don't want? So that's what you want. And it will begin to align you with experiences that match up to what you are telling it it wants. Because it can't make a distinction between what you are thinking about and what's going on in your life. So tonight and every night for the rest of your life, the last five minutes of your day, use it. Use those five minutes to enter into a place where you are seeing everything manifesting exactly the way you want. Self-actualizing people, said Maslow, never put their attention on what they don't want. It's always focused on what they intend to create and what they intend to manifest. And then the seventh of these things. I call it natural, just the word natural. So when people say, what if I do that and it doesn't work? And you hear this all the time. I hear it on my radio show all the time. When I was being interviewed for the ABC News thing, Dan Harris was the guy that was interviewing me on ABC. And he's about five foot seven, weighs probably 150 pounds, 145 pounds. And he said, uh, so you're telling me, this was after four hours of interviewing, following me in London, following me in New York, coming out to Maui, filming me, spending several hundred thousand dollars. They had to. It went for four minutes 
on uh, the Sunday after last Thanksgiving. And he made it as negative as he possibly could make it. And it was all about my leukemia. And why would you listen to Wayne Dyer? Because if what he was saying was true, there's no way that he would have leukemia. It can't, and none of this cannot be true. And I would say to him, I don't remember ever saying that if you listen to me, that you're not going to die or something isn't going to happen to your body. It's much more about how you handle the things that show up in your life rather than telling yourself that it'll never happen. Nothing it comes into this universe that doesn't go through the four stages of life. Birth, growth, decay, and death. And I even told him, I said, life itself is a sexually transmitted terminal disease. Okay? <laughs> so that's the way it works, you know. The question isn't whether there are going to be storms in your life. The question is whether you can learn to dance in the rain, whether you can learn to enjoy the storms of your life. You know, as Elizabeth Kubler-Ross put it, if you shield the mountain from the windstorms, you'll never see the beauty of the carvings. And the beauty of the carvings comes from many of the obstacles that show up in your life, including leukemia, which to me is a great gift to teach other people all the other things that I've gone through as well as a teacher. That's what I came in here for. So I said to Dan, he said to me, so if I listen to everything that you're saying, you're telling me that if I put into my imagination that I want to be a linebacker for the New York Giants, that it's going to come true. And I said to him, Dan, does that feel natural to you? And he said, no. He said, I'm five foot seven. I'm gonna... Then I said, why in the world would you want to put into your imagination something that feels unnatural to you? Now, the question becomes, if you have been overweight all your life or if you have been... Uh, kicked around all your life or you've been poor all your life, are you able to say it feels natural for me to feel prosperous? For me, it's always been very easy for me to say, I believe I'm entitled to all of the abundance and prosperity of the universe. And no amount of my achieving something is going to keep anybody else from doing that. I just know that to be true. Some people can't do it. And that's where you have to go back, realign yourself with God and recognize I am God. I am. I am. So that's the keys. To watch another amazing Wayne Dyer video, check it out right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. You have to dissolve your ties to this false self and the world that perpetuates it. As long as your shallow, worldly ambitions...